Harding. Rick has been a member for, gosh, how long have you been around here? It's been seven or eight years by now, isn't it? No. It's been a while. You were at U of M up in Flint. Yeah, six or seven, I guess. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, he's going to he's gonna tell us all about running an open source project. Keep, keep letting me come back. Yeah. Um, so I want to start out just to ask the huge, monstrous audience here, how many of you guys use open source software? All right, how many of you guys that use it have contributed a patch, landed documentation, code, or something to an open source project? About half of those that have used it. How many of you guys have <coughs> your own open source project that you, like, run in? maintain or trying to build a community you're working on yeah okay a lot of wavy hands on that one okay um so my hand was up pretty solid yeah uh hello i'm rick i'm the big bald guy they let me come back once in a while and talk to you guys uh i'm one of these lucky bastards i get paid to write open source software by day and then my wife lets me write open source software by night um so i have a problem uh, <laughs> So, you know, hello, my name is Rick, and I'm an open source developer. Um, and I can actually say that without pretending too much anymore. Um, this is my little GitHub profile from the last year. And so you figure out, you know, 1,400 and change commits over the last year. That averages a couple a day. I'm, I'm doing all right, you know, and there's some holes. Yeah. But, um, yeah, hecky, hecky, hecky. Now I cheat because part of this is work. Now that we've moved our work project to GitHub, I get bonus points. Um, <laughs> and I have no shame uh, at all. So. When I started thinking about this talk, I really wanted to be like, okay, I'm, I wanted to theme it somehow. I wanted to be, you know, teach a lesson. And this sounds really sad, but I kept coming back to this idea of like, I should do like the seven deadly sins of running an open source project. Or like, you know, Dante's levels of hell of running an open source project. And they didn't quite map out, although there were a few that really, I was like, I can relate to this one. Um, definitely, the levels I had some really good, you know, if you're a really sucky, you know, project owner who doesn't respond to comments or ever do pull requests, you know, there's a level of hell for you kind of thing. They didn't work out. So what you have is this just me meandering around, and I will tell you about my project, Bookie. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Bookie is an open source, delicious, like, bookmark, management, replacement, web app. Um, I started it years ago because delicious had pissed me off. They got bought by Yahoo which meant that they stopped doing anything ever. And I got fed up with it. And I thought, clearly I alone can build something better than a big company with paid employees. <laughs> I mean, after all, what do they do? So um, I do want to post this giant disclaimer. There are many paths in the open source world. Um, this is one. So by all means, I think there are some interesting lessons from both users of open source and people that would like to develop or even run a project. but. This is what I got to work with. This is how, how I've lived my life over the last few years, right? So first, I think all projects, everyone says, open source is scratching your own itch. I'm like, no, 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 I get an itch. I go, eh, and I stop. <laughs> open source projects come about because of pain. I was angry at Delicious. You bastards, you're not actually giving me what I want in a product. Come on, man, there are cell phones. This mobile version, this is awful. I had like a whap version of delicious bat, you know, it's just irritating how bad it was. <coughs> and I was like, you know, I did bookmarks. Bookmarks are full of pages of content. Google lets me search the whole web. Why can't I search my bookmarks for, like, content and stuff? And, you know, hey, I like to own my own data, you know. At the time, right around when I started this, it was announced that delicious is going to be sunsetted by Yahoo. Oh, crap. I've got years and years of bookmarks in that tool that's about to be sunsetted. How do I get it out? And where do I take it to? And how does this work? So, you know, it was soon to be shut down. And I don't know why else I started this. It made a lot of sense at the time. Looking back, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so, step one of an open source project. <laughs> you hacky, 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 hacky on something, and it works. And you have excitement. And I am an awesome developer. I have built a tool that does something that I set out for it to do. Woohoo! I'm the man! <laughs> right? So for me, this was, I went to a, for my first PyCon, and I'll, I was safe for the sprints, which I will say, if you ever go to a conference and they have sprints, stay for the sprints, because I got to hack with the developers of open source tools that I used at work. And I submitted my first patches to open source projects like at the sprint. I sat down with the guy of Fabric, which is like an awesome Python automation uh, deployment tool kind of thing and I actually like my first thing was like fixing some of their test stuff and it was kind of cool like here I officially contributed open source 
and the guy that wrote it was sitting next to me. Mm. So I'm like, hey, what is this? And he goes, oh, I know, because I wrote it. You know? So it's very, very cool. So I had sprints for four days, and at the end of the four days, I had a web app, which I could bookmark something, and I was awesome. And I was like, woohoo! And I thought, ha, 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 ha. I have built a tool, and everyone will use it, and I will build a big customer base, and I will get paid to work on open source software, and this was the future of my career, is in this cool tool I built. Except, <laughs> your next stage is pretty much disappointment. <laughs> because you're like, all right, I built this tool. Why doesn't everyone use it? Like, where's my community, my user base, my people submitting patches? You know, all my friends are like, that's nice, Rick. Um, you hacked on a thing for a weekend. Uh, that's, that's great. Um, so basically what you find is everyone has a reason not to use your tool. And I, I'll admit it, I'm a user. And, you know, hello, I'm Rick. I'm a user, and I'm lazy as hell. Um, and so is all the other users out there. And if it doesn't do one thing, everyone had like their pet, well, your tool doesn't do X. So what they do, they don't patch X into your tool, they go find another tool that has X, you know? And so what you find is it's, it's, uh, it's not quite this whole like blooming, flowering garden of open source that you kind of dream in when you first start this little process. You kind of realize that, well, okay, um, back to myself. And so you find, the answer to this problem is um, not to find people to help fix all your stuff, it's that you just have to write more code. A lot, thought, lot, <laughs> lot, lot, next year, more lot, more years, lot, lot, lot more code. <laughs> because you have to fix all these things that everyone wants if you want anyone to use your tool. And to be honest, um, oftentimes what the users want are things that I would also want. So we get to writing lots more code. So then you're like, ooh, okay, I've written lots and lots of code. Now where's my community? Like, come on. All right, let's get some patches in here. Let's get some users. And then you realize, no, they really are, are lazy. Um, and the fact that no one knows about you. Like, you have a little software project. And everyone, you know, it's not like Google pops up and says, hey, have you heard about this new cool open source thing, you know, at all. So um, you have to realize people will think that, well, this is just a hack. Like, you threw some code together over a weekend, I could do that. Now, I will say, in defense of the guy that throws code together over a weekend, for every one guy that does that, there's a million that don't, who go, oh, I should write some code to do that, and then they never do. Um, but it really is, it's the truth, right? So what you have to realize is that if you're gonna start an open source project, it needs to be about you. It, it can't be about, I see a need, I'm gonna try to do a business thing, I want to be famous, whatever, like, I think all the successful open source stuff begins with finding a guy who starts it, who just needs it, believes in it, wants it, and uses it. If the, if the developer doesn't use it, um, and it's not a huge community where others rely on it and now find it important, then you're just hacking on some code, right? Like, let's just be honest, right? So if, if you don't love it and you're not gonna use it, then put the code up somewhere and forget about it, and just don't worry about it, because you're, you're heading for like, you know, it's just not gonna work out. So. I kind of want to just, you know, this is a little bit repressing, but it's like you have to realize that no one else is going to do the work. No one else is going to write all the code that you, that's missing from your app. No one else is going to go out and publicize it and tell everyone how awesome it is. Um, let's see, no one else is going to, you know, plot out your future and your milestones and, and, and make you sit down and, and work it or whatever. It's all on you. This is just your pet thing. Um, and for me, it was this bookmark app. I have a pet project. It's my problem. Um, but what's been cool is that I like writing software. Uh, I care about bookmarks, and because of that, I've hacked on this one project for, come on, I'm only fourth year of it now. Wow. Uh, and over time, eventually stuff kind of turns around. So you kind of hit where you've started to get a few people using your tool, and they come and what you find is you have like, a, I call it community 0 0.5. Like they're not really true community, it's like the, the hit and run. Um, and what they do is they come and they're like, hey, this is cool, um, and they maybe submit a documentation update, and then you never hear from them again. Or, hey, I got it installed, this is cool, and then you never hear from them again. And it's just kind of like, you know, you're starting to get this little bit of a wave building of people trying it out for a little bit, and then they disappear. And, but you know what? You have to be okay with that. Like, it's not, you know, that's just the way I think these things, at least in my experience, go, right? So I, when I started to get that, I'm like, okay, I, I'm doing something wrong. Um, I, I, I need to find a way to make things less painful for new contributors. So, um, I try to do a lot of things. I, I said, you know what, users don't want to do hard work, they don't want to install the software, so I, I pay every month for Amazon to host a version of it where you can go sign up to bmark.us, plug, 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 right, and go 
sign up and create an account and import all your bookmarks from whatever other tool you were using and use it. So, you know, there's users as far as users of the software and you can do that for free and, and it's valuable to me because it gives me interesting data points as far as people trying it out, spreading the word. And maybe someone cares enough to then submit a patch or get involved or whatnot. You never know. Right, so, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of work to do. Like whenever someone would, you know, set up their first bookie instance, we made sure to give them an initial bookmark. Um, to, you know, make sure that they could import their bookmarks from something else and try it out, right? So, this is what my bookmarks look like on Delicious. Import. This is what they look like on, you know, Bookie. Like, how do I like them? How does it compare? How do the features, you know, you want to be able to give them the tools for this stuff. Um, you want to make it really easy to use. The first version of the thing, you had to go click add and paste in a bookmark and you were like, yay, I can save a bookmark. Well, users like their Chrome extensions and Firefox extensions and they like their scripts and whatever. Um, and sometimes this takes a lot of work. Uh, um, Matt's not here, but the Firefox extension would not exist if it wasn't for Matt. Matt wanted to use Firefox, and he got so annoyed that he started to write a Firefox extension. Doing Firefox extensions, I find writing them extremely painful. And every time I would start, like, all right, users, I need users. I want Firefox users to come use my tool. Because uh, they're open source hippies, and I have an open source tool for open source hippies. Like, you know, we must you know, make this work. And it was so painful I couldn't get over the hurdle. So Matt wrote an initial one that worked, and then I got involved to help get it up to speed and stuff. So, um, and the big one, there was one year where all I really did on Bookie, because um, I kept trying to have at, at uh, Pi Ohio and other conferences, I'd be like, hey, let's have a Bookie sprint. And I realized all we would ever get done, we would manage to get a couple people to have it installed on their system. And it was like, boy, that sprint was um, less than useful. Uh, so what you have, to, you have to realize is that your thing has to be so amazingly easy. Um, so I almost took a whole year and a minute to use make and offline download caches and simplify the install process to where this is how you can get running with Bookie on your own instance. You clone it and you paste this in and when you're done, you can run it. That took a year of my spare time, <laughs> you know? So on the one hand, I'm very, very proud of these lines. On the other hand, like, did I add a cool new feature? No. Like, did it help me at all? No. Like, you know, it was, it was educational to me. I learned a lot about build systems and building software and all this kind of stuff, but it's the kind of thing that if you want to try to grow a community, you have to worry about are all these user pain points. Um, and so like I said, it's almost a whole year in the making. So, how many of you guys deploy software um, at all? Build it or whatnot? Okay, so these are, these are my lessons um, from that whole year of work. Uh, make is amazingly awesome. I will preach make till like I die. Everyone that says, well, use grunt, no use gulp, no use, but I hit him in the head. And I say, stop, go back to make. Download caches, making things work offline and be version locked and ready to go. Super awesome. Um, dependencies, managing them sucks. I found that I had a lot of dependencies I no longer needed because I had moved on as the software evolved and I wasn't keeping up with trimming them back and stuff. Um, you know, version lock the ones you do, uh, but also dependencies are awesome because all that is code I didn't have to write. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, you have to build, you know, how often when I first got started people would be like, I've pasted the install steps, it doesn't work for me. What do you mean it doesn't work for you? Well, because Unless you're building over and over and over and over again every time you change the build system, you don't realize that you broke it. <laughs> um, or a lot of more, more likely is people on different systems and different stuff. So you have to do this over and over and over again. Um, and it ends up that you know, if you learn enough life lessons, you're like, hey, continuous integration, Jenkins, automatic builds, these are a good thing and there's a reason that people do them. Even for open source software. Uh, actually having continuous integration tests and builds are very powerful tools if you want people to use your stuff. So, then you get the teasers. The, ooh, I like your project, this is super awesome. And I still gonna submit a patch. I'm like, ooh, okay, cool, I've got a contributor. All right, now they're really gonna start rolling in. And you work through them, you work through them, you work through them, and then you find that, you know, on the one hand, Every little patch you can get helps, right? I, there was some guy that, you know, at first it was like, oh, all he did was a little documentation correction update. But you kind of have to learn that, you know what, that's, an, that's a fix I didn't have to spend my time on, right? So even the little small ones I learned to appreciate over time more and more as there were known issues of like this text <laughs> didn't line up with that text on the account page. And it, I didn't care. Like that wasn't on the top of my list of crap to do tonight. 
And when someone fixed it, everyone got a nicer looking page, and I didn't have to touch it. And you start to go, dude, you rock. That's awesome. You know, like, thank you, man. So one thing is you have to learn to appreciate every little bit. And I think the other thing you have to learn is to have no life. Um, the only way to keep people interested and, and working with you on stuff is to be as responsive as you can be. So uh, people that who doesn't use IRC, oh, I thought there were hands in there. Yeah, yeah. You, have, you, have to, you have to use IRC. Like, you know, it, it is the best. Uh, it is, a, you know, everyone wants to resolve the problem of IRC. Again, it's like, make, stop. You know what, like, the problem's been solved. Everyone idles in IRC in a channel. Whenever someone pings you, you get a nice little highlight. You can see all the log. You can put it on a server and never, never go offline. Um, and it helps you be amazingly responsive. Some dude jumps in and goes, I'm having an install problem. And I can go, what is it? And he gives you know, a little bit of an error. And the guy that I walk through and get him over that hurdle has now turned into a possible contributor. Whereas if I wasn't responsive, he'd have been like, I can't get it installed. And he would have wandered off and done something else with his time. Right? And you have to realize that when people are trying out your stuff uh, and they're asking questions in IRC, they're doing that on their time, just like when I work on Bookie, I'm doing it on my own time, right? So um, you have to help make sure that they don't feel like they're wasting their precious hours of their days as well. So these are some of the cool things in Bookie that would not happen without this, these contributors coming in. Uh, again, I mentioned the Firefox extension would not exist. There's an Android app because someone wanted to play with an API and learn Android, and they wrote an app. And it was like, holy crap, like, that wouldn't exist if it uh, wasn't for this kind of community building and stuff. Lots and lots of bugs got fixed, just straight from community people who got involved and they wanted to, you know, they tried it out, something annoyed them, they got a patch, they may never have come back again. But you know what, the bug got fixed, so that's awesome. Um, and one thing I want to kind of point out as far as something I think that's been really beneficial, I rewrote the API in Bookie three times. Um, I would go to a conference and I'd go to some API talk about how to do a good API and I'd get inspired and realize how utterly crap my API was and I'd go back and rewrite it. Um, which on the one hand sucked because rewriting code is bad, but it eventually got to a point where having an API was amazingly awesome because the guy wanted to write an Android app and I said, well, here's the docs for the API and he wrote Android and talked over the API to Bookie, and you have to worry about the back end of stuff. He didn't have to build a back end to store bookmarks and search them and all that stuff. He got it for free. So for him, he wanted to play an Android, and by having an API, I let him do that. Um, there's a guy that wanted to learn Angular, so he started building Angular JS web front end to Bookie just using the API. And this was really beneficial in a few ways, because now I've got someone interested and invested in Bookie because they're building something on top of it. Um, and it found a lot of bugs and little corner cases of things when they were trying to use it that I didn't <laughs> test for and I didn't know about. And so I will say, uh, you know, one thing I did to manage the site is I wrote a, a command line app that talks to the API for like deleting users and resetting accounts and retrying imports and stuff. And I will say, all tools of any, any, any sort should all have an API. Like they're just amazingly useful, awesome, and they're, I think they're community enabling uh, for people to get involved, maybe not work on Bookie, but maybe start to build a little periphery around it, you know? And that is just as valuable as getting, because if someone goes, oh, Bookie has an Android app, I will try it over another bookmark service because Bookie does have an Android app, then that's pulled in, you know, they've been sucked into the vortex um, that would not have existed before, so. So wait, so eventually you're like, hey man, look at all this crap that wouldn't happen without a community. So it's like, wait a minute, do I, do I see over yonder hill? Like, a community building around this tool I wrote? No way! Like, that kind of crazy insanity are you speaking? And so then it happens, and I think every project hits this, and this was a, it's kind of a story time. Uh, <laughs> someone forked one of my projects and worked on it and wrote a whole lot of awesome code. He took a library I wrote in Python, he made it work in Python 3, he um, updated some tests and stuff for it. It was just freaking awesome. So, uh, story time. I want to go pull up on the magic carpet. There was one time this guy took my little project and he forked it off on GitHub. And GitHub, I hate you because when someone forks your thing, they don't really tell you. You get a little number that increments. And unless you go follow them and track it and star it and watch it, you don't know that they did anything with it. So. This guy forked my library. Six months later, I realized he had, and he had done a lot of work over six months. Well, I had done a little bit of work over six months. Mm -hmm. And I was like, dude, this is awesome. I want to pull your changes back into my changes, except he didn't believe in make files, so he removed it. 
He didn't like my folder organization structure, so he moved all the files around. He had ported everything to be Python 3.2 safe, which moved a lot of other stuff around. While I had my own set of diffs, and merging it in was a nightmare. It wasn't easy. And as far as he was concerned, he didn't care, because he had the tool he wanted, right? He took my starting base, and this is the, this is the joy and the curse of open source software, right? On the one hand, someone found my work valuable, they ran with it and did awesome stuff with it. Um, you're like, you know, yeah, like I did something that matters. On the other hand, you're like, no, commit back to the community. And he was like, eh, I don't need to. Like, that's a lot of work. <laughs> I, wanna, I got what I need. So it came back on me to basically take a weekend and to sit down over a weekend and go commit by commit of his and resolve conflicts and merge it in and put my make file back in and to do this and to do that. And, what was funny was that I had a couple of bug fixes that he didn't have since he had forked it off. So um, it took me a whole, I lost a whole weekend to get it back in. And it was a lot of, like, and I mean like full eight hour day weekends, you know, a weekend there to get that back in. So on the one hand, I was, and Craig can, can testify to this, like I was bummed. Like I was like, you know, man, like this is just so rough because you're in a no-win situation. You want the code, but I mean, that was hours and hours of work I was not planning on doing. Um, but when I got it done, and he saw that I had bug fixes, he actually went through and was like, oh, okay, so he started to use mine. And then we talked online a little bit, and I added him as a committer to the repository. So like, hey, look, if you want to fix a bug or something, you have access. Like, go ahead. Like, I've seen your work. I, can tr I trust that you, you know, know what you're doing. I've seen that you can run with this for six months on your own. And so now I've got a guy who's on the other side of the world, and I don't know what he does, but he hacks on my library once in a while, and we kind of try to work together. And it's tough, but by getting over the work and getting over the hurdle, I started to build, again, you start to get the community going. And here's, now there's two contributors, not just me, um, which is nice. So at the end of the day, what you have to realize is like all this, all this stuff just turns into more and more and more work, right? And so one thing is kind of funny because people are like, oh, Bookie, like that's a cute little open source project. What you don't realize is that Bookie's really a lot of stuff now. There's, this is the actual commit history for Bookie back to 2011 here. And this is, oh, look, I, I did a lot, I did a lot. And then like, oh, I kind of took some time off mm -hmm. and whatever, whatever. Well, then you realize, well, then there's a Firefox extension. And here's where I started it and then did nothing. And then Matt took it up and then we started to work on it together. And B mutability, this is a library I wrote because I was initially using a library that had no tests and was, it got me started, but it was awful. So I, of course, what do you do? You, you know, you're open source. You just like write your own code. You fork, you fork it and run and do whatever. So you can see, what, I tried to line up like this 2013 timeline. So you can kind of see like, you know, while things slow down here, they picked up here. While they, you know, were slowed down here, I was working on the CLI when it was, you know, hmm kind of consistent here, and then, you know, here in October, I was working on the Firefox extension and not much down here, you know. So, this little pet project, I'm going to do a bookmarking site. <laughs> I now have like a GitHub org, and it's got, there's, this doesn't even include the Android app, the Angular app, um, and other things in the ecosystem. So it kind of like grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And so, um, if you go look at, you know, Bookie, you might go, hey, Rick has abandoned it for this month, so you realize, well, no. He was just working on a library that's a requirement for this this app to live and exist for that for that month, and you know you're kind of still active and all that. So, um, so eventually you gotta go, and there are many many times in the years of this where I've been like, all right, why am I bothering with this? Like maybe I should put this thing to bed. Maybe I should, um, you know, it works, does what I needed to do. You know, why do I keep bothering with it? Um, and so. Every time I get there, I start to realize, you know what? I'm, I'm proud of the work. It's not the most awesome project ever. The code is not <laughs> the cleanest, most elegant, bug-free code ever. But you know what? I've got a, you know, I've got a lot of blood, sweat, and tears <laughs> in, in, the, in this code. So you know, and I, and I do. I, I still use it to this day. And whenever someone comes up and uses it, there's a little hint of, you know, you get a little pride that, you know, yeah, someone else finds my thing interesting. Uh, isn't that kind of cool validation? Um, the other thing is that, you know what, a lot of times people, I, I do, you know, I'm trying to do some interviewing, and you ask people like, hey, you know, do you guys do test, uh, testing with your code at work? No, I mean, I've always wanted to, but work doesn't really believe in setting aside the time for that, you know. It's like, okay, well, do you guys do continuous integration? Do you do, um, 
documentation for your code. Well, no, you know, work doesn't the work doesn't let us do that or whatever. <laughs> well, I mean, having an open source project means that it's my way. It has a make file. It has tests. The tests pass. You know what? The JavaScript library. So it's like, you know what? I wanted to code. I wanted to write code at some point in my life that had tests that you know ran in CI. That at one time I wanted to use jQuery and Backbone, and then I went, wait, 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 no, this sucks. I'm going to go learn UI. I'm going to write it in YUI instead, and I switch out the whole JavaScript end on it. Um, that you know, that I can write uh, the API over and over again, and the documentation, and that you know what, like no matter how bad work is, I can go to this one place and have work that I'm proud that I did. You know, and it has my name associated with it. And I will say, as someone that interviews, if uh, I'm interviewing someone for a position and they don't have any code visible at all. It's a huge red flag. We have a guy right now that's highly <coughs> recommended by three different canonical employees that I'm interviewing. And my first interview, I was like, no, I, you know, I can't do it uh, because he had no code to look at at all. And it's like, you know, I, I'm taking you on blind faith. And it's like, even if, so when I interviewed, I had, I had Bookie out there, which wasn't the best thing out there. But they could look and go, yeah, this guy's trying to learn how to write tests. And yeah, look, this guy's you know got decent documented you know comments and stuff in his code. And I almost wonder if I got the job more on what I had than what I you know I, I spoke well enough to not get kicked out the door. But I almost wonder how much actually having real life code to go look at um, mattered as far as getting my jobs. Um, and, and you know it doesn't hurt. That's for darn sure. So all this said, this is kind of very doom and gloom, right? Like. You know, Hello, I'm an island. I've been writing code for three years that no one cares about, except once in a while. Um, then this year kind of happened. And this year has been really, really crazy. Because um, I've always wanted to, I've always loved, and you know, I, I co opted in, in college where you work part of the time and they find you a job in your industry and you go to school. And I firmly believe it's the only way to go through college, right? Like, you know, everyone's like, college isn't required anymore. You should just be able to go. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I think there's value in education. But I think there's also value in doing real work so that when you uh, get done with school, you can say, I have a degree and I've done some work in an office with people, you know? Like, I've not just sat in my little dorm room and, and filled out papers all, all the whole year. Yeah. You know, and Google Summer of Code, I think, is awesome, where they pay a student five grand to, to sit at home in the summer and work on open source code. And this year, two days before the deadline, someone posted something on my Twitter feed or something, and I was like, oh, I've always wanted to do that. I'm going to you know, write up a proposal for Bookie to be a Google Summer of Code. What's the worst that can happen, right? They say no. Yeah. And so they didn't say no. They said mm. yes. <laughs> and I was like, cool. All right, cool. Google says that I can, you know, have a student or two to work on Bookie for the summer. That's awesome. Um, I had some, you know, potential projects for them to do. And so as soon as they announced, hey, here's a list of 190 projects that you can get to know and talk to about working with them for the summer students. Here's a list of 190. And within like an hour, the Bookie IRC channel started to go from like our normal 8 to 10 people to like 12 to 15 to 20 to 25 to 33, up close to 40. Every one of them being students that jumped in and were like, hey, I see Bookie's a Google Summer of Code project. I'm interested. What, how do I get started? And I was like, crap. Um, hello? <laughs> I just found out an hour ago that I was selected. <laughs> I don't know how you get started. Um, so we quickly threw together a Google Doc of like, you know, here's a list of projects, and here's, here's how to install Bookie, and here's what it does. And so our first thing was, was go to the doc, install it, try it out see what it does, then come back with questions, and here's a list of bite-sized bugs that I had marked in the bug tracker, because you know I had this dream that one day someone would be interested in wanting to work on Bookie, so I left these little bite-sized small bugs for others to fix, because that way they could get into it, right? And suddenly it happened. I had all these students, 30s of them, like showing up wanting to fix little bugs, and I'm like, well, here's the bite-sized bugs. And this was amazing, because out of all these people that came and installed Bookie, I think two couldn't get it running. One was trying to do it on Windows, which I said, <laughs> so what? I don't even know, man. <laughs> um, a lot were on Mac, which they were like, well, I'll throw it in VirtualBox and then put it in a Ubuntu image, and it just worked, because uh, that's how I run it. And then one was a CentOS guy, and his patch was to actually make the make file work in CentOS. So through this process of get to know your project, <laughs> All the bite-sized bugs got closed out. Uh, Bookie runs, there's instructions for it for OS X, for Arch, uh, Ubuntu, and CentOS now. It'll, you know, make install or whatever. 
a lot of things got fixed, and it was insane. I think I worked probably 30 hours a week on Bookie and 40 hours a week on work. <laughs> and my wife was like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I just signed up. <laughs> Um, but it was really cool. Um, we ended up with 32 applications for two slots. Um, Kivi, I know you guys know about Kivi, the, that's only the one I know the numbers for because Ben Roush or whatever is involved in it. They had f seven mentors, they had six applicants, they only accepted three. So, like, and they're like running Python apps on Android, been around a long time, we're part of the Python Software Foundation org, whatever. Like, so, like we really had a huge amount of participation. And this has just been, I mean, it's awesome, right? It's like the open source developer dream that you've got. Mm -hmm. Google's gonna pay students five grand this summer to implement two new features on Bookie. One guy's gonna add private bookmark support, which I pumped it on because I said, well, this is open source and I'm not gonna promise anything's private. Like that's, <laughs> that's, that's a problem I don't need. Um, but I think we're to a point now with our tests and our integration stuff and a student's gonna work really hard on it, so. And external bookmark support, so like wire a bookie to like Twitter or Identica or whatnot and pick out URLs that are shared with you where you share and turn them into bookmarks for you and such. So um, it'll be really cool, interesting. I kind of get to mentor a couple of students. Hopefully um, there are a lot of people that, that didn't get selected that are hanging around, albeit much more low key, um, submitting you know patches and stuff and getting involved and it really has just been awesome. So. This is the um, credits file for Bookie. Um, so this is the, uh, the almost four years down here to, uh, I think, Michael Hanna. So there were 18 over about three years and change. And then from 18 to 30, so there were 12 in one month. <coughs> so, you know, I mean, to me that was just, every time I got to add one of these little names here, I was just like, woohoo, <laughs> you know. Um, so then this guy jumps in IRC and I recognize the name IRC named Yelmer um, because he used to work at Canonical. And I was like, oh, I haven't seen him in a while. Like, just, you know, I look in the company directory. He doesn't work there anymore. But he asked this question Is anyone trying to package Bookie for Debian or whatnot? And I'm like, no. Like, why would you do that? That would be really, really hard. It has lots and lots of dependencies and seems like it would be really crazy. Um, and he's like, okay. So he filed an intent to package Bookie. Uh, and what's really cool is in the bug, people are like, oh, thank goodness, like, Semantic Shuttle was kind of like the open source bookmark app out there right now. It's completely unmaintained and it's going to be, I think, almost removed from Debian, like it's, you know, not supported anymore. So there were people, like, really excited about having Bookie available to run their own bookmarks, you know, run their own data, open source, you know, these are the open source hippies of the world that, you know, kind of got me started where I was like, hey, I want to own my data. I uh, got excited about Bookie and some guy wants to package it and I was like, oh my god, like that's awesome. I mean, how cool is that? So then one of the dependencies, the B-readability library I mentioned, um, that the guy forked off and I did all the work to pull back in or whatnot. Um, it's a dependency and he packaged it and this is the page from Debian. So I've written code, open source code, mm -hmm. that is available in Debian right now. You can go app get install my source code. That's good. So it's like, oh my god. Debian, I'm a Debian, oh! <laughs> 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 I never want to stop, you know, I mean, that's freaking cool. It is. And because of that, we're starting our new version, Utopic. Um, I've got code in Ubuntu now. Um, and it's because some guy jumped in, everything was there, and he wanted to put a little bit of work to join the community to, like, get the, the product off the ground. So then I went to PyCon, and I'm like, hey, um, uh, Paul, like he's a, a guy I know who's with the Pi, uh, the, Pi, Paul Pi Yeah, he's in the uh, he was he helped run the Ohio Linux or not um, a bunch of user group or whatever for a while. Anyways, he's like, oh, that's really cool that someone's packaging that for Debian. That'll be really awesome. Let me know if you need any help because he's a Debian developer. And he's like, yeah. He goes, um, Mako uses Bookie for all his bookmarks. And I'm like, what? <laughs> no. He's like, yeah, no, totally. I thought you knew. I'm like. No, no one ever told me. This guy's been out here to give talks out here before. He gives a lot of talks. And he's, if you don't know who he is, you know, then I'm sorry. But, you know, if you do know who he is, the fact that he uses my software was like, you know, again, this is unconfirmed. I just want to say, like, I've not talked to him about it. But rumors from people that know him and talk to him directly is he uses my bookmark app to keep track of his own bookmarks. And so, you know, and I'm like, I'm Debian. Famous people use my software. And like, oh, my gosh. So... I guess kind of my lesson with this is that 
And this is just, you know, the path that Bookie is on. I won't even say it has gone through because it's nowhere near done. But it's kind of like this idea that, you know what, this, this stuff takes time, you know, and it takes, I mean, you know, I've almost quit several times. Um, you know, and I've taken time away where like I've done woodworking for three months and not touched Bookie other than to make sure that the thing still ran. Um, and that's okay and it's healthy, right? Like you can't, you know, you have to be able to do that. But I want to say like you have to be prepared to work, to go it alone, and to learn new things, right? Um, when I wanted to run my own Bookie instance up on the web and I wanted to put it on uh, my own servers, I went and got a colo and a rack and I had to sysadmin it all and you know like you know you have to be willing to like go the extra mile to do things that aren't just oh I hack on my software project like no you gotta be able to do the full gamut the testing the CI setup and all that kind of stuff um, so what's kind of crazy y'all have to keep in mind is you never really know with open source software how how wide your impact really is I don't I didn't I don't know if Mako uses my stuff right uh, at all and so like this is that B readability library um, and I pulled the stats down, and I hadn't even realized it got this way. So, as far as I'm aware, I'm the only one that's ever really used it. <laughs> but it had 355 downloads last week, and about three grand in the last month. <clears throat> and this was kind of cool. When I searched for B-Readability, this other project came up. And this project had changed to using B-Readability as a dependency. So, now there's a library that depends on my library to keep moving. You know, I didn't even realize it, because until I went and did the search for this talk, I didn't know. Um, and at PyCon, there was a guy that's like, be readability. Like, oh, I think my old job uses that as part of their document like processing workflow or whatever. And it's like, really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> so um, the other thing I want to say is I've thought many, many times about rewriting it. And you guys know Joel Spolsky? Mm -hmm. He has this thing, the giant lesson from Mozilla is like never rewrite. And I've taken that to heart, and I think that's been a really good thing because Never rewriting means that A, you get to practice software in the real world where you get handed crap software and your job is to make it uncrap, or at least try not to add too much more crap to it, right? Um, and it keeps you moving forward, right? I mean, I just spent my last three years working on just the web side of this thing and not doing the Firefox extension and not doing the Chrome extension. And I wouldn't, the project wouldn't be where it's at today. It wouldn't be packaged in Debian or uh, trying to get it packaged into Debian if that was the case, right? It would just be a little small thing that I hacked on. But it'd be really beautiful because I rewrote it like four times, and it'd probably be in you know Node.js or something now, or you know <laughs> some other language, or you know, written in Go or something. <laughs> so, any questions? Yeah. Can you demo it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. By all means. Um, yeah. So, does it run on Windows? Magic <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Who cares? I mean, why it does? So, I mean, this is. He's, this is this is bookie. Like this is this is really it, right? You have URLs, you've got users, you tag your bookmarks. The one thing that I really like in Bookie is that when you click this little eyeball, um, that B readability library, it takes this URL. So let's go look at what the web page. This is what the page looked like. Right? Yay, very readable. I have to scroll through and find where the hell the text is at. Um, and it actually like pulls it in and tries to blurb out the, you know, find the text, the content and stuff. And so, like, here's an HTML5 imports page, right? So, you know, this might be a little bit easier to read um, than this, although right. this isn't bad. But um, in general use, you'd be browsing the web and you see an interesting web page. Yeah, so, like, so this, is how, take I, us this, is, that, yeah. this is how I test whether stuff's working, okay. right? <laughs> so I go to, like, news.google.com, I click on one of the first articles, and I go, okay. And then I go click on my extension. Well, this is one of the really cool features that Google Summer of Code student recently added. We now parse the title and the URL of the page to suggest tags oh, for wow. you to use oh, nice. based on the page you're on, right? So, like, cool. I don't know what this is about, but I think Europe and, Kirk, uh, and Turkey and accident sounds, oh, and Cole probably sounds really good. So now I'll bookmark it. So this would be instead of putting it in the Instead of putting bookmarks. it in my browser bookmarks, right? Because what's nice now is I can go to Firefox and go find the same thing, right? So now if I go to Bookie, I'll see I've got this bookmark, and it's been tagged with these tags, and I can actually, this is what it pulled out as like the readable content, which doesn't always work great on really crazy articles. <laughs> um, and then if I search for Turkey, it pops up, right, <coughs> as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have an issue where I'm having a problem scaling out a full text search engine, whoosh, um, in theory I'm supposed to be able to do this. 
Uh, well, not even Turkey. So what was it? It was Cole. It was CNN. So let's look for CNN, I guess. A word I did not tag. Right. And it didn't work. So of course not. Because I would want it to. Um, so I mean that's I mean that's the nuts and bolts of it, right? Is is I can go to my you know that's not where I wanted to go. I where is the data stored? So the data for this is stored in a Postgres database on, on Instance I run on EC2. It's supported to run in SQLite, MySQL, though someone pointed out there's a bug in the data migration script for MySQL I have to fix in Postgres. So um, the data is, in this case, is stored on my server, uh, my EC2 instance running or whatever. So, so if somebody else starts to run Bookie, their bookmark, they're, yep. they're going to store it on your server? You're storing the data? No, no, no. That's what I mean. Like, if you set up your own instance, it's yours. It's like running WordPress. You can run WordPress locally, or you go to vmark.us and you can run, you can not bother with it and, and use your bookmarks here. Cool. Right? And this is what I mean by a lot of users don't want to install and run WordPress locally, but they want to use WordPress for a blog. You know, and that's kind of what I had to do to get. And so this is, you know, it's, it's, this isn't huge, but I got a little dashboard down here. Um, so, you know, right now there's 410 users with bookmarks on vmark.us. Uh, they've got 100 and almost 22,000 bookmarks in the system, uh, of which about 114,000 are unique. So there's an overlap, you know, people have duplicate bookmarks. Mm -hmm. And you gladly share that with uh, the NSA? <laughs> I, I don't have to, right? They just automatically find it. I will say. <laughs> they're, they're your backup for <laughs> so This runs on 1004 servers. And so it was kind of funny because there was the big, you know, I, I do pay, I pay for the servers to run this on, I pay for an SSL search so that your logins are encrypted. Um, I do try to, I mean, I spend money to make this a uh, decent experience for users. Um, but what was funny was that the, uh, the SSL hack came out and I was on so old a version of uh, SSL library that I wasn't affected. <laughs> Yay me! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because what I don't need to do is spend my time worrying about these things. Um, so. Um, and then, so then there's the flip side of this is uh, so that B readability library is interesting. I actually use it just like as a read little bookmarklet, and this will send it over to r.bmark.us. So, you ever find a website where they use a horrible, small, tiny font that you can't actually read? <laughs> I click the button in my browser and I read it. <laughs> and what's great is like this is stored and backed in Redis. So, if I shit now, I read this article, I'm like, hey guys, this is really cool. So, I go into IRC and I paste it. So if I go, uh, go open a new private window, um, notice it loads up instantly because I've cached the parse results. I didn't have to go refetch the page and stuff. So this is what I kind of mean by like a suite of tools that have come out of you know things. And then if I run Firefox, um, which I haven't run recently, so it's gonna, you know, I've got my, I've got my bookie extension in Firefox too. You know, and this stuff just. I mean, this is spare time, right? No one's no one's giving me money to work on Bookie. I don't I don't charge. I don't have any users paying fees. I don't have any kind <coughs> angel investor donations. So this is all spare time stuff. But I feel like without Bookie, I would not be as good a developer as I think I am, right? Like it's this has helped hone my skills and has not relied on work to send me to a training seminar or whatnot. Like you know, these days it's on you. And open source software and running a project, be getting involved, don't run it. Go find a project you use and love and find bugs and contribute. Like, we love it as an open source you know, developer, you know. Um, question? Yeah, you said that you post this on an easy um, instance. Yeah. And then you pay for your user. Maybe your customers So, I, for a while I ran reserved instances. I just said, you know what, I need two. I run the database and I use a a background processing worker that run, uses Redis, they run on one server, and the web front ends and the workers are on the front end. <coughs> so uh, for a while it was around 60 bucks a month or whatever, I think it's up to about 100 now. Um, Rackspace has kindly donated an account um, for us to use um, because we're open source. So like our CI system is running, um, that runs the tests and stuff for every commit and landing. Um, it's hosted by Rackspace, who very kindly has given us an account. I've thought about moving the actual running instances over. Um, I've just not gotten around to mess with it yet. Um, again, that's the, the pain point of this, right? Is like migrating the server, resetting it up, and all that stuff. On the one hand, will help me 
get better at those kind of tasks about migrating running applications and you know putting things on pause so that I can have time to move the database and whatnot. But it's time I'm not working on bugs in Bookie or working with the Google Summer of Code students and you know so it's there's a big chunk of like if it ain't broke <laughs> if it ain't broke yet uh, don't fix it so. But yeah, I mean, I really, I probably drop about a hundred bucks a month on bookie, which I consider like a hobby, you know. And could I drop a hundred bucks a month on bowling or something if I was a bowling aficionado? Golf sure. or whatever. Yeah. Golf. Sure. So on the one hand, I don't consider it that bad, but I know everyone thinks it's open source. It's free. It's free. It's free. Like no, it's expensive as hell. <laughs> By the time you count the hours, and you know, trying to make this stuff pleasing place to come and work and hack, um, it's expensive. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so you can run it two ways. It's bookmarks would be stored on your local device, yeah. or we can take advantage of your server. Exactly, right? So. Well, you have to install the service on your own server for that right. to happen. <coughs> so, you know, this is my develop instance. I can run, I'm going to cheat and just make run it. Oh, no. Maybe not. <laughs> Why is that not there? Make files are awesome. We should do more of those. Um, this is going to take a second. Brian's going to get mad at me in a minute. Uh, anyway, jeez, um, where did that go? <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, call the make command that makes it. You know, so oh, I don't have a database. Um, yeah. Anyways, the, the, what I'm trying to prove here is like you can get clone the code, you can run it, and everything's on your system. You own it. You can put it on SQLite, run it locally. You could set up Postgres and run it with Postgres like I do on your own company server. If you wanted to have a company shared bookmark app, this is there. It's free to use. Have at it. More fun, you know. So, so then you have the browser plugin. Can you point that browser plugin yep. at your own instance? So yeah. So it's annoying on the one hand. Most users get cranky because they're like, I don't understand. But, you know, in the configuration of the extensions, you tell it what's the URL to your bookie instance, what's your username there, and what's your API key that the site will give you. Um, which is why people are interested about this in Debian, right? They could app kit install bookie and then have it running and then go and, you know, change the user or whatever, point their extension at it. Then this kind of fits in this whole own your own data world of, um, you know, run your own bookmarks. You, you know, there's a lot of people that there's a lot of companies that are delicious. There's Clipped. There's Pinboard um, that you can you know pay or ads or whatever to to do this stuff. But um, mm -hmm. or go your own path, right? It's pretty cool. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. Any yeah. Idea how many people are You can see how many are subscribed to yours, but there's people that not. Yeah, so so there's 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 410 that have bookmarks. I, I don't track how often they go. Um, one thing I do have is I run analytics, or no, I can look at things like um, so I can look at like analytics of like how many people. There's 49 people using the Firefox extension. There's um, go away. I don't know. There's you know, a hundred or so that use the Chrome extension, maybe. Um, you know, I do run Google Analytics on the bookmark site, but um, because <laughs> the way the front end works is this is all JavaScript. Like, if you turn off, if you go disable JavaScript, let's see. Uh, where do you turn off JavaScript these days? There it is, left under general. Left under general, yeah. here we go. So let's disable JavaScript and reload the page. Oh. <laughs> Not there. <Yeah. laughs> um, <laughs> that's because the front end is all JavaScript and it talks to Bookie's API. And I did this because I wanted to make sure that I consumed my own API so that if the API broke or sucked, I would feel the pain before users of the API would, right? So um, it was an interesting experiment, right? Like I wanted to just try out an all JavaScript front end app and I wanted to try out using APIs and stuff, and so I own the app, right? So I can do whatever the heck I want. I did this. Uh, some people can complain. They're like, hey, there's no good reason why you couldn't just dump out the template, you know, like loop through in a template and give me all the HTML. I'm like, yeah, you're right. There's not. 
Um, I'm accepting patches. <laughs> yeah. Well, not even that though, right? Because I don't want to do that. Because I, I want to use the API, right? And maybe I have enough API consumers where that's not as big a deal anymore. But you know, um, everything you can do to make sure that you catch the breakpoints before a user does is a good thing. Because if you feel it and fix it, then that's a, another potential person who might contribute who didn't get turned away because it didn't work out of the box, right? Any other questions? Yeah, code quality. Yeah. How do you guys manage code quality on projects like that? So, because I mean, you got to look at a bunch of crap code coming in. It, it's the, it's right? the Rick barometer of the pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and I will say, um, so I, you know, back in February, I became a team lead, and I will say this has helped me, especially the Google Summer of Code. The team lead stuff happening has been awesome because I've learned a lot about running a team of developers and being supportive, but still holding to certain, like, we need this, like, this is non-questionable right now. Um, you learn to phrase things in really flowery ways. This is an awesome, awesome patch. How would you feel about writing some tests for it? Let me give you an example. Here's a test that looks a lot like the test of what you would need for your bit of code. And so that requires, so a lot of the time I spent in Bookie while the Google Summer of Code stuff was going on, I didn't write a line of code, right? <laughs> like, it was everything I could do to go through the six to 10 pull requests every night and review them run code reviews, comment, this looks good, this is that, this should really might be better over here, I see what you're trying to do here, here's some recommendations, you know, and you want to do it in, as an enabling and non-condescending, constructive, constructive way yeah. as possible, right? Because at the end of the day, I want this branch to land, right? Mm -hmm. This is 50 lines of code I did not have to write. You know, that, I mean, having, this is something I wanted when I first Started Bookie. I wanted to have tag suggestions, right? Computers are smart. They can be able to figure some of this mm -hmm. stuff out, you know? When the Google Summer of Code student wrote this, it was a big chunk of work. It needed a lot of review and cleanup and stuff. But, like, man, I wanted it. And he worked hard. He went through several iterations. He used three different libraries to try to pull out what the important text was. Like, you know, just was freaking awesome, right? But that's how code quality works. This is basically, at the end of the day, I ha I'm the one who lands it. And if I'm going to land it, it needs to be a, of quality or at least where. Oftentimes, if it's small, I'll take the branch and like, hey, and I'll pull it down. I gotta QA it and run it through tests and stuff, anyways. And I might just, you know, clean that up, reword that comment, put the period at the end of the comment line. You know, I mean, you gotta be willing to kind of meet them halfway sometimes. Um, at the same time, if I made a big change of the code, I would go, hey, you should look at what I, you know, I love what you started. I tweaked it a little bit. Here's the link to the commit to go see what I changed, so that you can kind of learn, you know. And so it's personal preference, right? You know, you don't want your preference to, to shoot down a potential contributor. Um, no, but you've got a coding style that you want to. You maintain. do, right? Yeah, exactly. And and what's and this is what's bad. Like this is four you know four years into this project, my standards have changed in four years, right? <laughs> like you know. You don't meet your own standards from before. No, no, I totally don't. Do what I like, say now. Now, yeah. if, if you want to land a if you want to land a patch, I want to test for it, you know, and not uh, every line is tested, so. But we're starting now with the automated stuff to go look at getting code coverage tools running on the test suite. So the guy who's working on the private bookmarks, I told him, I said, well, I just want you to know, like, if you want to do this project, the first thing you're going to do for the first chunk of Google Summer of Code is just write tests. Because you're going to have to make sure that anything that touches querying, searching, loading, filtering a bookmark um, has 100% test coverage so that when we go in and add a private flag, that all the tests <coughs> will break. <laughs> because we added a private flag and we will have to add new tests, duplicate every test to say here is the public version and here's the private enabled version, right? Because if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right, very securely, we're not going to leak data. And the only way to promise that is to cover that code in tests, so, you know, so, and he's excited about it. He's, he's going to learn more about writing unit tests and stuff in this Google Summer of Code project than he will in his whole four-year degree at college. Mm -hmm. You know, make them more valuable. Absolutely. Exactly, and that's why I look at it, right? Like, you know, I, and that's why I love. I'm the one. I, Bookie is going to get a lot better test coverage. It's going to get an awesome new feature. I'm going to mentor, and you know, it, I really enjoy teaching this kind of stuff. And so it's just like a huge win, 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 as long as you're willing to put the time into it. So, so Google Summer of Code says about 10 hours to 20 hours per student per week. So um, it'll be a chunk. I haven't done woodworking since Christmas. Um, <laughs> so, um, but 
again, it's it's all. Oh, your you know, projects move to the next level though, too. You yeah, know, right. And so, but what would be really awesome, and what started to happen towards the end of the cycle with this stuff, is some of the guys that had started out early at Google Summer of Code, you know, the, the process of get to know a project, apply to a project, get to know your project. It's gone a couple months now. Um, started to sit in IRC and answer questions and help people get started. You know, and like this could be the springboards where I don't have to answer every question or I don't have to review every patch. You know, mm -hmm. one day, one day. I have a dream. <laughs> Someone else will loan the land code for me. <laughs> um, but we're not there yet. Yeah. It's JavaScript. Oh, um, so because the back end is Python and it uses a lot of libraries that build C extensions so they're fast, um, the B readability library takes HTML and parses it like XML and searches all the nodes and all that. And to make that fast, it needs a C compiled extension, which is hard to do in Windows. And the make file, like make, doesn't run in Windows, I don't think. I think there's ways of. You need SIGWIN and a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah, so I mean, could someone make it work in Windows? Yeah. <laughs> and that's something that I'm interested in dealing with. Or, or even one guy asked about um, making it work and submitting the documentation for it and stuff. And I said, I got to be honest, man, I, I, I don't want you to waste your time because. You, but you, you have to be willing to say no because every patch, every branch, every feature you land and accept, you're now on the hook for maintaining, right? So um, if I accept a whole, because he had to like basically fork off the whole install process and all this stuff to work in Windows, and I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to maintain it. Like, I mean, it's, it'll get out of date and I'll never know and someone will have a horrible experience and they'll blame me. So I'm like, you know, at some point I have to just kind of scale back what I'm willing to spend my time on and Windows support isn't one of those. Well, I think the other thing too is that if uh, if Windows, if someone wants to work around the current framework and get it running under Windows, and there's minimal patches and stuff like, you know, if this, did Windows then do this type stuff, and work within the existing framework, I don't think there's any problem with that. It's just, again, there's, if it's a huge amount of effort and it's separate effort from mm -hmm. the actual build process, <laughs> I love this. Yeah. Yeah. Wookie, Wookie, Wookie and Windows could be Wookie. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions? Everyone ready to go submit a patch to your, your favorite open source project now? Or at least have pity when they take a while to respond in IRC yeah. or when they don't immediately merge your pull requests. You can go, that's okay. Um, the guys that have really popular like frameworks, that tools I use, SQL Alchemy, Pyramid, um, the, it's, I don't know how, you know, that those weeks of the Google Summer of Code influx of six, eight patches and stuff a day and people wanting the questions in IRC constantly, like, like there are projects that live like that and I don't know how well they do it. Like I was like more impressed and more, you know, I'm not worthy of these guys that run these, these big projects. Yeah. Um, how about a suggestion about the best way to do the bug reports? I can, I can see myself being really verbose, and you know, I got this kind yeah. of process and this much RAM. Maybe they don't need to know that. Is there like a vanilla flavor way to make a bug report so that they can zero in on it? Bug reporting is an acquired skill, that's for sure. Um, so, as a small upstart project, I don't care. Like, you know what? I work with people. Like, they submit a bug report that doesn't have enough info, and I'm like, hey, could you check this and this? Like, I can't duplicate it here. Like, you know, I have to work with them. Well, just like the branches, the land a branch, right? You may get a, you know, a branch that, you know, I don't even know what the hell this is supposed to do. Like, can you, <laughs> let's, let's start a communication dialogue. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know. I, I would say maybe look at the other kind of bug reports on the project. Those are, you know, what I would look at are ones that have been received well and marked fixed, and then look at ones that have been just like marked as won't fix and see if there's any lessons to learn between them. Um, but I think because uh, I, I work in open source by day, we do stuff with bugs by day, by night, like I eat, sleep, and breathe bugs <coughs> and bug reports and managing them on our work items and the, the Kanban board that I kind of showed in a talk a couple weeks, a couple months ago. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm too close to the problem to give you good suggestions on that. All right. Do you have any questions or anything at all? Um, let me know. We want to start a 